see. <laughs> Is that Dave? Yeah. Show some respect. You do hear, I mean, you do hear things uh, in pubs, in restaurants, in, in bus queues, anywhere, and uh, you hear the one most wonderful lines in the world by just listening. You know, the best lines just come straight out of life. <laughs> and fall through the bar, so saw, saw it happen. Hey, Trig, Trig, huh? Trig, over here. A pub called The Jewels on top of Ballam Hill. Yeah. The guy did it. Exactly like that, showing off to some girls, him and some mates, showing off to some girls over here. And I was there with a couple of my mates, and uh, he leant forward to get a light from his mate's lighter, and then the barman come out, and, and we went through. He never actually hit the floor, he stumbled down, he got up, and he did one of those embarrassed giggles, <laughs> like I meant to do that. Uh, and I just, I just stuck with me, and, uh, and again, I think I was at the BBC club, and I. We were talking about things, and I said to David Jason, I saw this thing, I'd love to use it. And I don't know how or where. And we, and we must have waited ten years before we got the opportunity to use it. Someone came up to me one day and sort of said, uh, you know, I want to ask you a question, Mr Jason. I said, yes, certainly. He said, you know that thing when you fell through the bar? And I said, yes. And he said, was it an accident? And I said, what do you mean, was it an accident? He said, did you mean to do it? The construction that went into that to make that work was, was very interesting. I don't think everybody at the time thought it was going to be a classic moment. Everybody looks at it and thinks, probably, oh, that was just, he fell through the bar. But it was meticulously rehearsed. I mean, we didn't rehearse him falling through the bar every day, obviously, but we talked about it, and David and I had long conversations about it. I had a tremendous grounding in the theatre. And I was the one when I was in the theatre, I did all the Brian Ricks farces um, and I was on tour in plays. And one of the great things that I did was, was it was very physical. I was very fortunate in, in being able to enjoy it. Getting thrown out of doors and diving into settees and diving through hatches. So it was quite natural for me. We can't go wrong here. All we've got to do is learn their language. Why, they're foreign then. <laughs> What we did was we had Roger Lloyd Pack and David Jason trying to chat up two birds. So the important thing was never to cut, to make was to hold the shot. And if you look at it, we never cut. We just held the shot in a quite a loose shot, which was quite, you know, because normally if you've got a funny moment, it's to cut into it and make it bigger. But if we'd done that, people would have known it was coming. And of course, when it happened and he just leant back, nobody suspected it at all. I think we're on a winner here, Trig, all right? Play it nice and cool, son. Nice and cool, you know what I mean? David held that fantastic position, that rigid position. <laughs> then you got another laugh, because Roger just turned around in that wonderful trigger kind of moment where he just looked and said, oh, what happened there? And then David popped up with that immortal line. Trig up, Trig, Trig up, we're leaving. <laughs> Are you going to try for them birds? No, no, you're cramping my style, mate. You're cramping my style. God, doesn't get better than that, does it? <laughs> that over the years, Fools and Horses has developed. It stayed in the same place. It's Peckham, obviously, but the actors have got older. The characters they're playing, they got older and they started to get girlfriends, and then Rodney married and we brought in Cassandra. He's only got one of those silly little ponytails. <laughs> <laughs> what a wally. <laughs> Looks like he's wearing a Davy Crockett hat. <laughs> then loads of stories with Raquel. Derek, will you get it into your thick skull? I'm not trying to meet intelligent and sensitive people. I'm happy with you. They married, they all moved in, and then we ended up with Damien. Mars and something else have come into conjunction and decided that he will be born in Peckham. The whole family cycle has moved on. Let me introduce you to Damien.
And I believe the public are sitting there probably saying this almost mirrors, not exactly, but mirrors our lives because we joined that show at a certain age and we've moved along with it. Yeah, because they have changed. Obviously, their various attitudes have changed, but the focus is still the same with them. It's, it's always survival and, and beyond survival, trying to become very rich. This time next year, we'll be millionaires. My name is Perry Egojenov. I'm the president of the Only Fools and Horses Appreciation Society. I mean, I was a kid watching the show. I've grown up with Rodney, he's my age, and I've experienced all the things that he's experienced as well. It's grown into quite a phenomenon, really. It's kind of taken the country by storm. Uh, we have 6,000 members now worldwide. We produce our own quarterly newsletter called Hooky Street, and our latest venture, as Del Boy would say, we have diversified. Um, we're, we're doing Trotters Ethnic Tours, which is basically ta taking the Trotters to the people uh, to experience everything, the wonders of Peckham, shall we say. Once a year we put on conventions, um, generally in the Mid Midlands kind of area. Uh, we're lucky enough to get the, most of the actors along to attend. Uh, attendances range from 1,500 to 2,500. And people literally travel from all over Europe to go. And they really get into the spirit of things. People turn up in their um, trotter vans. They come up in, some people come as dressed as Uncle Albert or a Del Boy. And uh, they get a chance to meet the actors. They get their autographs. Uh, they compose for photographs. But they really want to grab out that little bit further and touch the show. And through the society and, and the conventions and Trotter's Ethnic Tours, they can actually do that. We know it's not real but it's gone so far to, to almost being real that it, it's just touched on the British psyche, really. It's, it's just out there. You can imagine what it's like taking Fools and Horses out on the road. You know, as soon as anybody hears that Fools and Horses is filming down the end of your street, the whole world turns up. It becomes a complete nightmare. Well, the other thing is that our lovely press do their best to try and shoot something uh, of what you're filming so that they can go to say this is going to be what's happening in the Christmas special this year of Fools and Horses. Well, I can, uh, you'd have to ask them why they do it, why they wish uh, or think that they're, they're you know, getting a, a scoop or getting an exclusive to blow a story that you know, hopefully many millions of people are going to, going to watch on Christmas Day, why they feel it is their duty to spoil the story for everyone else, only they can answer. We're having to film outside, we're having to film in public places. So you have to, you know, you can't actually protect the story. You said we was only going for a couple of hours. Yeah, I know. And the Batman and Robin sequence, uh, they're going off to go to a fancy dress party and the car breaks down and they have to go through town to get to the party. But what was brilliant about John was, of course, that what he did was he then took that idea and invented the mugging situation. These characters came back and were mugging this woman. Suddenly, out of the mist, came Batman and Robin, which was just made the thing doubly funny. But when we came to shoot it, it was a nightmare because you'd obviously realise that every, we, we heard that nearly every press man from London had come up to Bristol to try and shoot this particular thing. So we had this street and we had people parking lorries, we had, we had show security in, hanging up blankets, trying to stop any camera, any, any press people came down. And I had these two guys dressed up as Batman and Robin and I just knew they'd get one shot and that would be the front of a tabloid paper the next day. So we just did this whole number about trying to hide it. We had them sitting around for hours while we put all this, all this security in. And we got them to run down the road twice. And all I did was, is I shot it on one size and shoot it on another size. So the whole sequence, apart from the bit of dialogue when he spoke to the mug, the, the woman, was then running down with just two shots. It was the simplest thing I'd ever shot, it, it, but the most effective thing I'd ever shot. I mean, if I had all the, you know, all the ability to shoot what I wanted, I would have probably overcomplicated it by miles. I'd have taken all sorts of shots of faces and feet and all that sort of thing. Down! Let's go! <laughs> Sorry, moustache. The thing about all these characters, I think, is that they are fundamentally decent people. They are loyal to 